we spend $322,000 for each enemy we kill in Vietnam, while we spend in the so-called war on poverty in America only about $53 for each person classified as poor. Every January, the Martin Luther King Day holiday is an important reminder that one of the defining characteristics of the American exceptionalism that Democratic and Republican politicians constantly mention is selective amnesia combined with historical revisionism. This year was no different. Dr. King, as he is celebrated in the U.S. by the majority of politicians and institutions, would be unrecognizable to King himself. Dr. King was a militant opponent of U.S. wars and militarism. And I knew that I could never again raise my voice against the violence of the oppressed in the ghettos without having first spoken clearly to the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today, my own government. Martin Luther King was a fierce advocate for the poor, the forgotten, the victims of the fabled American success story that's celebrated by its white beneficiaries. King repeatedly risked his life confronting not just racist policies or segregation, but the white supremacy that is ingrained in U.S. society to this very day. But King, the radical, the anti-imperialist, the anti-racist, is not the King that's celebrated today. That King wouldn't even be invited to his own memorial or the dedications of parks named in his honor. We must also realize that the problems of racial injustice and economic injustice cannot be solved without a radical redistribution of political and economic power. The real Martin Luther King, the King who J. Edgar Hoover tried to blackmail, wiretapped, and told King to kill himself, the King who described himself as a democratic socialist who believed in redistribution of wealth, the King who was assassinated, would today undoubtedly be labeled a black identity terrorist, and shunned by Republicans and Democrats alike for being too radical, maybe even anti-American. When Martin Luther King was gunned down, his popularity was at an all-time low. He'd been largely abandoned by his friends in the civil rights movement and was regularly denounced in papers and on radio and television for being too radical. Uh, Dr. King, uh, former President Truman, was quoted by the AP as saying that the march from Selma, and this was his word, was silly and can't accomplish a darn thing except to attract attention. Now there have been two murders, many beatings, and a federal expenditure for troops of about $300,000. Would you say that what the march accomplished was worth that cost? Perhaps it's fitting that just days before the Martin Luther King Day holiday, we learn that President Donald Trump had called black nations shitholes or shit houses. It doesn't matter which. We see you, Donald Trump. The Democrats express their outrage that the president would say such a thing. And Trump's defenders say, well, it's the truth, even if you don't like his language. But here's what the Democrats and Republicans and certainly Trump himself will never, ever talk about. And that's the U.S. role in destabilizing and mercilessly punishing the countries whose citizens Trump wants banned from coming to the U.S., or having protected status in the U.S. We will suspend the Syrian refugee program, and we will keep... We will keep radical Islamic terrorists the hell out of our country, okay? Believe me. Let's take Haiti, the first black republic in the world, the first country in the Western Hemisphere to abolish slavery, a country consistently targeted by violent, anti-democratic, racist U.S. policy ever since. Why don't we ever talk about the support that Ronald Reagan offered to the brutal dictatorship of Baby Doc? Or how George H.W. Bush and the CIA unleashed murderous death squads in an effort to stop the Democratic election of Jean-Bertrand Aristide, only to facilitate his overthrow in a brutal coup after Aristide won? Why don't we talk about how Bill Clinton would only allow Aristide to return to Haiti if he agreed not to seek re-election, or the inhumane way that Clinton treated Haitians fleeing the country and warehoused them at the Guantanamo prison in appalling conditions 
And that's almost a decade before Bush turned it into an illegal gulag for suspected terrorists. When the United States decided that if necessary, we would use force to remove the military regime and to restore President Aristide and democracy, I was so determined that no one would think we were trying to revive any hemispheric imperialism. Why don't we discuss the George W. Bush administration, once again supporting the overthrow of Haiti's democratically elected government in 2004, or the neoliberal economic policies pushed by Clinton Global and the Obama administration, or the story of how President Obama backed a corrupt government in Haiti as it used anti-democratic tactics in an effort to keep power. It's a great pleasure to welcome uh, President uh, Martelli uh, of Haiti to the Oval Office. Uh, you know, our two countries uh, really brought about uh, the trend towards independence in the Western Hemisphere. No Democrats or Republicans ever want to talk about this history. Yes, Donald Trump is a racist, a horrid, overt, shameless racist. But let's be honest, U.S. policy toward Haiti has always been racist. Trump should be condemned for what he said, but so too should all U.S. presidents going back well over a century who have ravaged Haiti in defense of corporate profits and the elite. On Martin Luther King Day, MSNBC repeatedly played this clip of Ronald Reagan denouncing the use of racial epithets, and he did it in a speech on Dr. King's birthday. And MSNBC contrasted that to Trump's shithole comments. As recent unfortunate events have demonstrated, we cannot be complacent about racism and bigotry. And I would challenge all of you to pledge yourselves to building an America where incidents of racial hatred do not happen because racism has been banned, not just from the law books, but from the hearts of the people. So there you have it, two presidents, two Republicans, two men claiming to be conservatives, and yet a great divide between race, even among two conservative Republican presidents. But after all these decades of progress, here we find ourselves with a reactionary, and yes, some would say, a racist president. The violent irony here, of course, is that Reagan is directly responsible for a tremendous amount of death and destruction in Haiti. And that little fact was not mentioned at all on MSNBC because history doesn't matter to these people. Only empty platitudes gain bipartisan praise. Now, I could also talk about the role that the U.S. has played in destroying Somalia and other African nations whose citizens Trump believes should be banned from coming to America. And it's not just Haiti and African nations. Tens of thousands of people in El Salvador were murdered tortured, raped in the 1980s as Ronald Reagan poured U.S. weapons, training, and funding to a heinous military junta. What we're doing in going to the aid of a government that asked that aid of a neighboring country and a friendly country in our hemisphere is try to halt the infiltration into the Americas by terrorists, by outside interference. That country has never fully recovered from what the U.S. did to it over a sustained period of time. Oh, and it wasn't just Salvadoran civilians who paid the price. Forces backed by Washington raped and murdered four American churchwomen. Archbishop Oscar Romero was shot dead as he performed mass. His killer, trained by the United States. Six Jesuit priests were murdered in their home by paramilitaries, backed by the United States. The priests were shown no mercy. During the night, gunmen invaded their dormitory, clubbed them, dragged them out to a lawn, and shot them. Two women caretakers were also murdered. You see, no one wants to discuss this history when we try to understand why El Salvador faces the violence and poverty that make people want to flee. So yes, we should all be outraged at Trump's racist words and his racist policies. They're dangerous, they're vile, but they don't exist in a vacuum. It's the U.S. that's been the shithole or shithouse in countries the world over. It's a legacy of racism built by Democrats and Republicans. And Donald Trump is a fitting person to now represent that racist legacy because his overt racist rhetoric matches this racist legacy that no one ever wants to talk about.